How are you all doing? Good, good. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Chris Nordyke, the Richard Nixon Foundation's Vice President for External Affairs, and it's a pleasure to have you all here at the Nixon Presidential Library um, for, tonight's, for tonight's special presentation. This is the second in a special series focused on the history of the Cold War and highlighting the spectacular new exhibit um, just on the other side of these walls. I, I think a lot of you made it through and got to tour Cold War Soviet spies and secrets, but if you didn't, you'll be able to do that um, after, after the talk. Our guest speaker tonight, uh, speakers, excuse me, speakers tonight are sure to deliver, and we're honored to have them both. Moderating the discussion will be Tony Cordero, an external affairs and community relations professional whose heart and focus is dedicated to our armed service branches uh, and, and their families. Um, Tony's resume includes positions at some of the world's top companies, including NRG Energy, ConocoPhillips, Citibank, and Boeing. But I think Tony's real passion is in leading the Sons and Daughters in Touch, which is a totally volunteer nonprofit organization committing to locating, uniting, and supporting the now growing children of American servicemen who perished in the Vietnam War. Tony has a long history with the Richard Nixon Foundation and is our, our kind of kind of our go-to military expert. Um, but more recently, Tony is the primary coordinator for the Nixon Library's annual Holiday Hometown Heroes Gold Star Family Commemoration Ceremony, which is, of course, every year. Um, we do it around Christmas time, and Gold Star families in the areas uh, are in the area are invited to come. Um, and represent their fallen with a personalized Christmas tree ornament that they hang on our Gold Star family Christmas tree, which is then on display in our front lobby through the holidays, and then those ornaments are sent to all the families, and some have come um, for you know, 12 years now. So it's a special program, and, and, and Tony has been leading up the coordination on, on that. Uh, tonight's featured guest speaker is Captain Dan, or Yank, Peterson who is the author of Top Gun, An American Story. Captain Peterson, and this, this book, I think most of you have it, is right here. Captain Peterson entered the United States Navy in 1953 and was the senior officer in a small group of men that formed the Navy's legendary Top Gun flight training program in 1969. He served in combat during the Vietnam War with the flying crews on the USS Hancock and the USS Enterprise and ultimately retired as a captain that accumulated more than 6,100 flight hours and uh, 1,014 carrier landings across 39 different types of aircraft, which is, I guess, the kind of expertise you would expect um, of someone that created the, Na the Navy's legendary fighter, uh, fighter weapons school known as Top Gun. Captain Peterson's autographed book is available for sale uh, in our museum store, which is just uh, up at our front lobby. You can't miss it. And I know that after the program, they are all signed. Um, after the program, he would be happy to take a picture with um, anybody that wants one. But before we do that, I want to hear, uh, hear his story. I want to hear Tony interview him. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, would you please welcome Tony Cordero and Captain Dan Peterson. That was almost like asking permission to come aboard, sir. No. <laughs> That's what driving two and a half, three hours gets here today when you're, when you're 87 years old. So I'm doing fine. He is. He is. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a thrill. It's a thrill for me to be sitting next to Captain Dan Pedersen and to talk with him about the book, the movies, uh, his life and uh, help you gain some insight into that. And, and the intent tonight is not to read the book to you. You're going to buy the book, you can read it, and you can learn some of that stuff. So we'll touch on the book a little bit, but I, I really want you to leave tonight with a feeling that you got to know the man, you got to know about his service, and then you got to know a little bit about his mindset and what he thinks about the military today and you know some of the challenges that we face as a country. So um, what I'd like to do, because 
Dan is a Vietnam veteran. I I'd like to ask a couple of real quick questions so we understand who's in the audience. Do we have any other Vietnam veterans in the, in the audience right now? Just a quick show of hands. We got a couple. Okay, thank you for being here. Um, other veterans from conflicts or, or wars prior to or after the Vietnam War? A few more, very good. Thank you for being here, we appreciate that. Um, how about some Blue Star families? Do we have Blue Star families, those who's got, who've got loved ones serving today? A couple more there, and some back here. And then how about some Gold Star families? Do we have any other Gold Star families in the audience, those who lost a loved one in combat or in a deployment? I'll represent that audience. Uh, so we've got all of them. We've got all of them, and it tells us a little bit about who we have here in, in the room today. Uh, so as we, we look at last year, 2022, uh, my first question to you is going to be an interesting one. Uh, Hollywood has a unique way of portraying things, and, and we'll ask for your opinion on that. But in 2022, we had one actor by the name of Glenn Powell who, in the springtime, was an F-18 pilot. And at Thanksgiving, he was an F-4 Corsair pilot in the Korean War. And he managed to pull po both of those off uh, because Hollywood enabled him to do that. But my first question to you is, with all that you've experienced, where does Hollywood get it right and where do they miss the mark when it comes to those types of war aviation movies? You know, the first, the first movie that he made, Tom Cruise made, was, uh, I don't know, it was entertaining, and uh, it, caused, it caused a hell of a lot of problems for the Navy and uh, made us very popular with good-looking girls. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, we, do, we lived through that one. The second movie, super great entertainment. Um, most of the public never realized that those pilots flying those airplanes during both of the movies were naval aviators. The same guys that made the second movie, Maverick movie, are at Fallon, Nevada right now today, 54 years after we founded the school. They're at Fallon, Nevada doing their job and flying. And uh, Tom Cruise has a different mission. It's called making money. <laughs> and, uh, the rest of us, uh, you know, we love flying. Uh, the guys at Fallon today are phenomenally good. I uh, never start this presentation, Tony, just a minute. I want to introduce Mary Beth. She's in the book. I'm not here to sell books. It's a good read. It's sold a lot of books. It's being used at Top Gun at Fallon as a teaching text. So there's something in it besides romance. And uh, I met her on her 14th birthday. So and and the I, rest. I will say, if I can interrupt you, yeah. it is, it, the book's a love story. It is a love story. It's a love story between the two of you. Yeah. And it's a love story about this man's love of aviation in the United States Navy and, uh, and our country. So yeah. uh, if that's a fair characterization, so yeah. be it. Is that good? No, I just wanted to, i like to introduce because when you get when we get finished tonight, meet her. Naval, the wives of naval aviators are the reason the guys stay with it. You know, it takes a special woman to go through that much deployment, separation, and uh, and uh, they don't get enough. They don't get enough thank yous. How about a thank you, ladies and gentlemen, please. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So you referenced Fallon, and, and for those in the audience that aren't aware, when Dan created and stood up the Top Gun school, it was at Miramar in San Diego County. It's now in northern Nevada. And uh, so one of the questions that I, I think we'd all like to know is, <coughs> what are the differences, good and bad, in the move from Miramar to northern Nevada, to well, Fallon? Have you ever been to the moon? <laughs> no. Uh, 
It was politics. A lot of it's politics. You know, the Marine Corps deserved and wanted to get out of El Toro. So they're going to stay on the West Coast because of Pendleton, Camp Pendleton. So they moved them down, took Miramar. We needed flying range with with the new jet airplanes and the distance we fly every day and what we do. Uh, we needed to go somewhere that had more open range time without the airlines interfering. And so, you know, I didn't like it at the time. The, th the thing about the politicians that make these moves normally are they never figure out you want to compare real estate values? Try San Diego versus Fallon, Nevada. <laughs> you want to you want to break somebody's heart and force a guy out? Get a woman who has to pull her four kids out of San Diego schools and start them in Fallon, Nevada. And that's what it was like. And. Uh, 54 years later, it's going strong as ever up there. They build new buildings for them, and it's the best in the world still. And, uh, and we'll tell you how it got started here in a minute. But yeah, they're, they are really, they work for you, and they're dedicated, patriotic kids. Kids. There aren't any of them. I was... When I started Top Gun, I was 31, and I was the oldest of the group, <laughs> and I'll tell you about that. Go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. So, again, go back to the audience. We'll ask, how many of you have seen the movie Top Gun, the original Top Gun movie? Show of hands. Everybody, right? How many saw Maverick last year? Everybody. Okay, so everybody's got a call sign, right? <laughs> Everybody's got a call sign. You've got Maverick, you've got Goose, you've got Iceman, you've got Rooster, you've got Hangman, Coyote, Phoenix, Payback, Fanboy, all these names. Tell the audience your call sign and how you got well, it. I'm not, and I don't even really, I probably some night in a bar, somebody <laughs> called me Yank. Maybe we were in Australia, if, you know, somehow Yank got stuck on me and, and the squadron guys heard it. And... It hasn't always been that way since Second World War. Even in Korea, they didn't use call signs. But we, in the jets, moving so fast, and, and, and particularly in Vietnam, uh, there were so many airplanes involved in the combat on a daily basis up there. You could never keep track of 102, it's being flown by Tony today, and 107's flown by me. And when you get up there, and you're doing combat, you can't remember all the numbers. But you can when you train and fly with the same squadron of guys every single day. They become very close. They become like brothers. And I recognize the voice of all the original eight. I can tell you right now, if I were to, when I be a word, pop up and I could. I could recognize the voice, and I know who Rattler was and Condor was, huh? and the great Condor, when you read the book. Condor was the youngest, 21 years old, at the, in the beginning of Top Gun, 21 years old, and uh, he, uh, just a phenomenal talent, but uh, they all either, some guys get given a call sign because of poor behavior. <laughs> and uh, some of them because of their propensity to look at good looking women. <laughs> and uh, some of them because of their flying skills. So Yank, let me ask you this question. From a, a literature standpoint, we see and we've become accustomed to seeing the word Top Gun as two words. Yeah. But in the book, a little bit of a giveaway, in the book, it's one word. Is there a reason or explanation for that? I think it's the way the Navy blessed it in the beginning when we got it up and going and, and they commissioned it as its own standalone squadron uh, with the success we had in Vietnam. They would give you about anything you wanted, frankly. It was that successful. You know, put it in perspective for you. I don't know how many of you have flown. I know Scotty and a few here. Yeah, but 
when we started Top Gun, we were five years into a war in Vietnam. Most of us didn't understand why we were there. It was a political war. It was being fought from Washington, uh, diplomatically, if you will. And the kill ratio was two to one. What I'm saying is, for every two of them, they got one of us. In the history of aviation from the First World War, Second World War, Korea, we, the American pilots, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, have never done less than 12 to 1. Later on, I'll tell you what real success was. <laughs> Remember, kill ratio. So in a business world, yeah. if you're going to create a new product or a new division of a company, it's generally because somebody's doing something and you think you can do it better or... Uh, there's some void you want to fill. When you looked at the need for this education of naval aviators in the Vietnam War, there wasn't anything to compare it to, correct? And if that's the case, what, what drove that and how did the realization come about? What happened was McNamara and Lyndon Johnson controlled the first five years of the Vietnam War. Okay, we were getting targets every day dictated by the think tank of McNamara coming in on the wire to the carrier and the carrier guys would plan it and we'd fly it. And we're getting our butt shot off. And it didn't feel good. And, and I had been out there twice and the original eight guys I picked all worked for me out of 15, I picked eight, the eight best I knew, and they had all been out there twice in combat, getting shot at it twice a day. And you come back with a lot of opinions. And you know, and it doesn't matter how old you are. That's something we gotta get smarter about in government. These young guys are as smart as the old guy. You go to Fallon right now, Top Gun today is being run by a young lieutenant commander, probably 30 years old. He's a training officer. They have a squadron commander because the Navy wants him to have a squadron commander. And he's a good one. He's hand-picked. And, and, but he doesn't interfere with the development of new tactics and things going on. He kind of he keeps his head down, handles the politics if they're come, if it comes along. But the guy running Top Gun is young. And that's the theme throughout 54 years. Condor wrote the foreword to that book. It's marvelous. There are eight elements in there that define the quality of the humans that are chosen to be instructors at Top Gun. And they've consistently, over the 54 years, lived with those eight elements. In other words, if you don't abide and can't deliver what those eight elements, you don't get selected to go there and stay. And the really good ones end up running the place. Sometimes I get windy, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, it's not simple to explain anymore. Well, let me make a comparison, Dan. Uh, if anybody in the room is a baseball fan, you know the struggle that goes on right now between the old school baseball people and new school analytics people. And this, this struggle goes on all the time. And every baseball team either is old school, believing that they can recognize talent and they can develop talent, based on the heart of that individual. And then there's other teams that say, no, 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 it's all about statistics and who does the best job hitting a curveball on Tuesday afternoon. And so it, I, I couldn't help but make that comparison when reading the book that ultimately it's the metal of that person in the cockpit that's gonna make them successful. Every single time the criteria for the, the best, if you will, in naval aviation, I'm speaking for, the best 
is the individual. It's not the airplane. It's not the weapons. We normally fly whatever we're given. That's the way the industry does things in the United States. I might change that if I were running things a little bit more because the American pilots and naval aviators have taken whatever they've given, and that's what Top Gun did. That's how we ended up with We ended up with 24 to 1 kill ratio. The MiGs in North Vietnam wouldn't even come up anymore. There weren't enough of them left at the end in 1973. And you know what it was? We, we revisited the missile system, made them work right. They hadn't put a gun in my airplane in the Phantom. You know, that's another whole story, <laughs> how we ended up with, they'd never build an airplane without a gun. You know, if it's, if it's a combat airplane. And, uh, and uh, let the pilots, and Top Gun actually, when it, success, when it hit that plateau at the end of the Vietnam War, Washington was coming to Top Gun to help them design and lay out the, the, the uh, abilities of the new airplanes that we were going to build as a country. And that happens for a long time until the politics gets involved. And pretty soon, and, you know, I'll talk about it later if you want, F-35. You know, 26 million, or 26 years to develop that airplane. 26 years. And over a trillion dollars. And you know what? One bullet can put it down. One bullet out of a 25, 40 year old MiG can put it down. So it's a pretty risky business the way we're doing it now. Well, let's stay on that for a minute because I was going to ask you about the F 35. And yeah. uh, the book talks about it a, a bit. So, folks, of course, read that yeah. part too. But let's talk about it. So, f you have a Joint Strike Fighter. And for the first time in American history, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force are all going to fly, fly the same plane with a little bit of different variations. It doesn't sound like you're a big fan of the plane. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you know, in the development phase, in the beginning of Top Gun, I was bulletproof. I'm a pretty opinionated guy, as you may know or can tell. But I'm pretty opinionated about things, particularly when you're dealing. I went on, commanded a squadron, commanded an air wing on a carrier Coral Sea. And you know what my main responsibility is? Keeping my pilots alive and being able to win every single time. And when you're responsible for human life, you got to be right and you got to do it. And I had, when, it, when I got selected to take the job, it was offered to somebody else. And then I was second choice. And they called me in and asked me, we need a graduate school, 60 days, and I thought that was ludicrous, 60 days they want to cl first class up and operating. And, uh, and I had, fortunately, I had a bunch of guys working for me at Miramar in tactics, flying the Phantom, and they were plenty good. All of them had been twice to Vietnam, so they were one guy had been shot down twice, got a MiG, and uh, probably the, as good as I knew anywhere in the Navy. So I grabbed him. And, but we got 60 days to build a, uh, a graduate level education, do it better than they've been doing for five years. Now, you're going to create some enemies? You damn right you do. Jesus. It's all the fleet squadron commanders that say, what? What does this guy know or what does it, this small group of guys know that I don't know? I'm a squadron commander. You know, I'm, I'm speaking for them in this thing. And I had a three-star naval aviator, vice admiral, named Butch Bringle. You may have heard of him. He was a wonderful man, great combat pilot, World War II. 
And he talk, called me in and he said, if you'll take the job, I will make you bulletproof. And that's the only reason I survived politically. And I went on, I had a carrier, I had a great take. Till I ran into the drug problem with one of my crew. I'll tell you about that later. But so let, let's talk about, as you, you talk about building the actual school, the graduate school. I guess if you're in search of a classroom yeah. to stand up a school, it doesn't hurt to have a case of scotch with you, correct? <laughs> it's in the book. Yeah. Uh, but it almost, as you read the book, ladies and gentlemen, you'll almost envision this is the kind of makings of a movie because how else could you find a trailer to serve as a classroom and find a way to put all this stuff together in 60 days, as Dan talks about, and then start training these aviators? So tell a little bit about that part yeah, of it. Young guys who have a mission like that, I just told them, I said, this is probably the most important thing we've ever done in our lives. And it was. And, you know, you give a naval aviator a challenge, he's going to do it, or you're going to fall on his sword, you know, trying. So anyhow, uh, you talk about, talk about a case of scotch. We didn't have a building. The war had been going on for five years. Miramar was full, cranking out pilots for the war effort in Vietnam. So, first of all, I, Friday afternoon, I told my admin officer, who was a backseater, I said, Steve-O, I said, we need a place. He said, there are no classrooms, there are no ready rooms, no place for it. I said, I got an idea where there's a couple old buildings. So, Saturday morning, coming down the street behind the main hangars at Miramar, suspended from a huge crane is a 20 by 40 foot building swinging. <laughs> <laughs> and he, they brought it down. He comes up to me and comes running in. He said, I got the building for you. Now, where do you want it? I said, we're going to put the building right next to the hangar, right by the, all the squadron parking was out here, all the COs. It, it kind of in your face, you know. Oh, but by by Sunday we put a floor in that building. We went to Home Depot, good old Home Depot, and we put a floor in and we painted the thing. Uh, and he he came in, painted trim on it, red and Navy Fighter Weapons School, no, you know, and then Top Gun. Nobody can say Navy Fighter Weapons School and write it and type it all day long. So we just, we grabbed on Top Gun by name. That was, and, and I said, Steve, where'd you get the building? He said, you just bought a case of scotch. And <laughs> he gave the crane operator a case of scotch. <laughs> and, uh, and Monday, Monday or Tuesday, he comes rolling back in there in a big 18-wheeler. And I said, where have you been? He said, I went up to Nellis Air Force Base. He went up to the salvage yard up there and took all the Air Force reject furniture out of the salvage yard. <laughs> and we brought back desks, you know, for the students. And we had two safes. And that's how Top Gun got started. Tom young, Cruise didn't sit in stuff like that in the movie, though. Young, young guys, I swear, every bit of it's true. It's all in the book. Young guys, we worked seven days a week, went to the bar every night about 8.30, we started at 4.30 in the morning flying. When the sun came up, we were wheels in the well the first morning. Flew usually twice a day, each of us, and then got ready for the students to come. And it got even better when they got here. So, the in the recent movie, they reference fifth generation fighters as the, <coughs> the, the planes that yeah. the Top Gun pilots yeah. are going to be opposed by, flown by the, the enemy. For the audience benefit, explain what that means, fifth generation. Boy, I get in trouble. I've been in trouble over this book a little bit on it. F 35 is an example, okay? Fifth generation. Um, First of all, they're radar proof. They coat them, you know. 
Oh, they coat them with this this coating. Uh, you can go in and, and be magic over the target, and they won't see you, except the enemy has eyeballs, and he sees you. So uh, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I'm, I'm making fun of it, but, but it, it's over-sophisticated, over-expensive, take too long to develop. You can't afford enough of them. Combat is going to have losses. In order to have pilots that are competent, you've got to have, you got to have, at my best, I was never getting less than 40 hours of flight time a month. Condor, in the book, you read about him. Condor, I'd have to slow him down. He'd pass 60 hours a month flying, and he'd want more. Jerry Sawatsky, ski bird, same way, big Polish guy. He just, they lived to fly. And, and as we developed the curriculum, we wrote the book again. We took the Phantom, got to live with the same airplane. Not very sophisticated, great airplane. And uh, uh, the F-35 has a lot of capability at the expense of pilot time for the rest of the naval aviation in my book. We got, we got 12, 13, 14, I'm, with the two new ones being built, nuclear aircraft carriers. Really marvelous, nothing like it in the world. Don't let the Chinese scare you. Their aircraft carriers aren't that good. You know, or the Russian. They don't, they don't do anything except steal our, our blueprints from somebody. And they've replicated when they can. They replicate uh, and try and try and uh, develop their own. And uh, I would go for more numbers, less, uh, more flight time, more numbers of airplanes. We've got these beautiful aircraft carriers. And when you look at the numbers of, of, uh, of F-35s as an example, there aren't enough airplanes. So what are we doing now? We got, we're developing uh, uh, drones, carrying big bags of fuel, drones. They're going to go up and do the refueling of, of the rest of the tactical airplane. I would like to go back to see simpler airplanes. Now, you know, why? I'm not against the industry. I'm all for develop new things, but be careful what you put them in and what the expense in the fleet Navy are. You know, if you think for a moment, some of you, that I'm adamantly against the, the uh, new airplanes, I'm not. But like when I had the Carrier Ranger, what do you think the average age was? I had a crew of 5,000, 5,000 men at the time. I had no women on board. What do you think the average age would be? Probably 19, 20. 19 years, six months. In getting the F-35 ready to go to the fleet, it's all contract maintenance. They're professionals, professional maintenance people who grew up with the airplane. And then we get them aboard, and thank God that we have chiefs and first class and the Marine Corps has their sergeants in the Air Force. They have that kind of experience mechanically to maintain that F-35. Or the few we have out there, uh, we wouldn't have them. They wouldn't be flyable on a daily basis. And, and not, not enough of them are, frankly. No. Boy, I get negative. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you, so in the book, you mention one of the desires that you'd like to see is the strategic petroleum reserve that our country has opened up and used to help provide aviation fuel so that these pilots could get the flying time yeah. that they need. And there's that, that struggle between spending a lot of money on a real sophisticated jet and then you don't have enough fuel to put them up in the air and give these pilots the, yeah. the flying time. 
uh, obviously Strategic Petroleum Reserve was used recently for other purposes, but uh, I, I know you'd like to see something like that happen so well, that there is enough flying time. You know, here in California, there's Strategic Reserve, and they hadn't been tapped in a long time until recently. And one of the reasons, the guys at Top Gun, I am the still called the godfather of Top Gun, okay? I go up there occasionally, not, not every class or anywhere near, but I go up, and between Condor and I and the original bros, we keep track of what's going on up there. And I talk to the CO up there personally, and I said, how much flight time do you get, Skipper? I got nine hours this month. That ain't enough to taxi safely. Right now it's snowing up in, in Fallon. They're not getting enough flight time. So I did a little digging in strategic reserve, although somebody beat me to it. But they, uh, I told them they ought to have a dedicated naval aviation, <coughs> maybe one for each service. That fuel. When the war starts, if it did, God willing it won't, but if it did, you're not going to have time to have a get well program again. The politicians will screw it up to the point and we'll have an accident somewhere in the world and the shooting war will start again. I pray to God it won't happen, but it might. Can, can we assume that the flight time challenge exists in the Air Force and with the Marine Corps just as oh, it does with the Navy? Yes. Hey, we are, we are subservient to the civilian sector of society. Don't you ever doubt it. And that's the way it's got to be. I thought about different ways of doing it. There isn't any other way. That's America. That's, that's the way the, the political system set up, the patriotic system, and it's got to be. The military has got to be subservient. And, and that's fine, but uh, we got to have a say in what we build and what we're asked. Who fights a war for you? It ain't the old guys, I'll tell you. It's the young guys. It's the guys under 30, whether they're combat Marines or Air Force. The airplanes are maintained by the chiefs and first class, second class. But the war and the guys in the flight leads, once in a while you find an older guy who really is gifted at it, as a warrior, will take the lead. And, uh, but it's always the young guys that fight the war for our country. I'm talking about, you can look at the black wall and you can look at them from an age point of view, or there's even a website out you can buy city in the United States. You can see who was in the service and what the, you know, who was killed. Yeah. And they're all young. And that's, that's okay with me. We do it because we, because we raise our right hand. I would do it all again to get that kind of flying. But when I see people closing down pipelines, and using the Federal Reserve to, or the, uh, the fuel reserves to negotiate price across the, across the Pacific. Ooh, it makes me scratch my head. One of the themes in the book is the rivalry between the naval aviators and the Air Force. Uh, is, is that, does that still exist? Is it healthy? No, and how no. does it make things at DOD no. any better? No, no. Not at all. We're, you know, during a war like Vietnam, Robin Olds and the Air Force guys had as much courage as the naval aviators did. Your dad did. Your dad did, Scotty. And in in the process of putting Top Gun together, I ended up up at Area 51. I flew the MiGs for, for a couple of weeks up there. I actually opened a hangar door, took me in and said, here, 
why don't you take it out and see what it'll do? I'm like, that's, you know, 30 minutes later, I was in the air flying a mate, Russian mate. And what you find out is that in the two weeks I was up there, I met three probably of the best Air Force jocks. They call them jocks. That's what I call them. And uh, they were phenomenal guys. And we became pretty much lifelong friends. And, and they got a great academy. There's a guy who, who went to the Air Force Academy who's a love member of our family, right, Doc? <laughs> and, uh, that's our son. He went to the Air Force Academy. And, uh, I forgave him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm his stepdad, so I get about half a vote. <laughs> but his mom is the one. So anyhow, um, before we get to some of the, the questions from the audience, I want to ask you some questions that are a little bit offbeat. Okay. Let's say that you could create a mixtape. You know what a mixtape is? No. Okay. <laughs> a mixtape, a collection of songs, of your favorite songs that you would play if you could blast it as loud as you wanted in the cockpit while you're flying at 35, 40,000 feet. What would some of those songs be? I don't think I'd ever do it. Tony, I hate to, <laughs> hate to pop your bubble on that one. I was hoping he's Sinatra. I, I don't uh, know. You know, I like, uh, I, like, uh, I like classical music. I try and quiet down once in a while in my life. And, and uh, we watch classical music in the evening a great deal at home. And uh, I'm a big fan of Sinatra. And... Uh, and uh, the Rat Pack weren't all bad. I liked to have been one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, I got to tell you about a night, you know. Naval aviation, mentoring is a key word that I use. I talk a lot to different groups of people. And mentoring is something that each of you can do, and that is, if you are good at what you do, teach some young kids today about mentoring. John Guyberson, he mentors people every day. That's his lifestyle. And, and I did that at Top Gun. I did that on the carrier. And boy, if you multiply those numbers out, you can make some great strides in very short order by mentoring people like you're doing with your, your Gold Star kids. And uh, I, uh, I got off on that one. But uh, mentoring is the future at low cost. So Good advice. Uh, here's another offbeat question. I saw the movie Maverick down at, at uh, Miramar. Yeah. At, at North Island. They, they showed it there in uh, the theater. And prior to that, one of the former Blue Angel pilots who was flying the F-18, you never saw him on camera, but he was flying the F-18s in the movie, he talked about this really unique experience where he was flying close to the water by Catalina and a whale breached out of the water. And he had to uh, evade that real quickly in order to avoid a really bad accident. In all of the flying that you did, tell us about some of the unique beauties of nature that you saw. You know, I, I started a moment ago into this because I still dream about it. I've come out of Salt Lake City, Hill Air Force Base, up uh, at Salt Lake, and day before Christmas, a crystal clear night, about 11 o'clock. I've been up there to a meeting and dinner. And I was in a Phantom by myself, not even in the back seat or with me. And I'm coming down from Salt Lake to Vegas. And I'm probably 38, 36, 38,000 feet, something like that. And I'm talking to, to the Las Vegas control. And and I said, man, it's quiet up here. He said, there's nobody up here. And I said, can I go up? And he said, you can go as high as you want. 
just don't boom in Las Vegas. In other words, stay subsonic going over to Las Vegas. Well, I'm a, going home. I got a bag of gas and just put it in afterburner, and I went right up. I went up to 50,000 feet, and I'm not kidding you. I could see Los Angeles, the lights over the hills from Los Angeles, Sacramento, the Bay Area, your favorite place. I could see in San Diego, the glow of it. It was the most beautiful night. And when I was up there, I carry a kneeboard card on my kneeboard, and I could read it from the starlight. That's what it's like being a naval aviator. So don't hesitate to encourage your young ones to learn to fly. And if you're going to do it, there's only a downside to it, and that's the night carrier landings, but you get <laughs> used to it. That's why your hands shake. I'm not nervous, believe it or not. I've got essential tremors. I'm going for a tune-up tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And... Uh, uh, but uh, my handshaking, Mary Beth asks me every once in a while, God, you're getting worse. And I say, well, I'm 87 years old. What do you expect? And I got 500 night care landings. <laughs> and I guarantee you that's why you get the shakes. So, so the last question before we go to the audience is for you to share with them. Some of you may have read about this in the news. Last September at 87, yeah. 87 Dan... Yeah fulfilled a dream, and he hopped in the backseat of an F-18, and he was flying with the Blue Angels. You want to tell the audience yeah, about that? No. And uh, <laughs> it would have been October last year. I get a call from Blue Angel 1, Brian Kesselring, whose grandfather was Goring's number two in the Second World War. That tells you something about naval aviators. But this guy's the leader of the Blue Angels. He's been there about two years. And he called me and he said, hey, Yank, he said, I'm having the 70th anniversary of the Blue Angels. 70 years they've been flying together. He said, I just talked to Top Gun 1 at Fallon, and he said he wants to come down, and I've got a photo airplane arranged, and I want you to come fly with me. Now, Blue Angel 1 doesn't fly with just anybody. If you get to fly with the Blues, if you're a public relations guy with the Blues, you fly with number seven airplane. <laughs> but to fly Blue Angel 1, and I thought, I'm 86 years old. I don't have any reason not to, but... <laughs> but <laughs> and then and this little blonde sitting down here, she said, right on, you're going to go. you got to do it. So I go to my, I get a friend out in, in uh, Palm Desert where we live at, at Eisenhower Medical Center. They had a cardiology out there. It's a good buddy. So I get the Navy's application paperwork, you know. Oh, he's got to fill in my health. And he's got to sign me off, okay, to fly with the Blue Angel. So I take it to this cardiologist, and he goes, are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're 86. No. So there's only one doctor I really know. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows me better than anybody. And it, and, and it was the last flight I had in naval aviation, but by far the best. We took off out of Los Alamitos at 3 o'clock on the 29th of September, 3 in the afternoon. I'm in the back seat. The right wingy is Top Gun 1 for Fallon, and the photo airplane's on the left side. And we go off, and they all follow the leader, right? And the airplane's beautifully painted blue. It's got my name across the back, Yank, Top Gun 1, and then Kess Brian Kesselring's name up front. And we go across there, and we are 500 feet, 500 knots. And it was the weekend of the Grand Prix races in Long Beach. And we went across Long Beach at 500 mile an hour, <laughs> at 500 feet. And he says, here we go up. And he checks in. <laughs> and he goes, and we went over Catalina upside down, <laughs> the three airplanes. <laughs> and then we went, I said, I said, what are you going to do? 
And he said, let's go down to Fight Club from the book. He said, let's go down and see if there's anybody down there on a Friday afternoon. And that was my, and it was, a, it was a, my stomach handled it, my old bod handled it, and it was probably the most memorable flight I had had in a long time. So it's the end of a, it's the end of a great flying career. And then to you young ones, it's really worth it. Outstanding. Uh, let's go to the audience. Nazim, you've got a mic? Yeah, let's uh, get a round of applause for you sure. two gentlemen first, yeah. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll come find you, and then uh, we'll go from there. And guess who you have. I don't know me. I'm going to ask a question. You know, I, after college, I was a, a flight attendant for Eastern Airlines 100 years ago. <laughs> and I have to say, don't underestimate the older pilots, because it was always reassuring to me, at least, and, and most of the girls I flew with. We, we had a lot of young pilots at the time that were just out of military school flying our our big jets, and I, I was always reassured when I saw that gray-haired gentleman behind, I was like, <laughs> he's been through some stuff. I'm just curious if you were a um, consultant at all for either of the films, and what I know, you know, we, I, I know recruitment um, really took a, a, it was increased after the first film, and I know our, our branches of our military service are really suffering, and it's awful, and what what you suggest we might do as you know to attract some of these these well, great young minds and you know the best ones are going to come and it, it's not an a academic achievement thing the best ones i think you got to find somebody that really wants to do it look around your grandkids look at your look at your boys it's pretty nice you know when you retire it's nice if you live through it and most of them do. And uh, gray hair, you know, airline flying is a whole lot different than the flying I'm trying to describe. I think you probably, uh, those who have flown combat know what I'm talking about. Uh, you deal in human life every single day that you do, whether it's training in Miramar or Fallon, you deal in human life. Those airplanes come apart once in a while lost a great one. Top Gun's only had, I think in 54 years, it only had two fatalities. One guy got caught out because somebody pulled the weather. The weather service from Fallon got shut off and a storm came through Fallon, one of those fast movers. It came across and uh, it shut the weather down and he couldn't get in the land. And he was in a kefir an Israeli airplane, and he didn't have enough gas to go anywhere. And he, he hit a small little building about 100 feet from the runway. Should have been there. But my, that's a bad story. But, but airline flying is different than the other. It's, uh, Did the other question, yeah, she wanted to know, did you consult on either of the films? No. Uh, Pete Pettigrew got out of the Navy, Viper. And you see him with, in the first movie, he's the guy standing at the bar with the, the good looking, what's her name, Kelly McGillis. He's, a, he's the older guy who's hustling Ke Kelly McGillis at the bar. Well, he got out after that movie. And he consulted on both movies. And the Navy did have to make sure the second movie was authentic and tolerable, <laughs> they, they took a group at Fallon and made them advisors. So we got, we got our oar in the water on this thing. Right? Speaking right. of the movie, before you go to the next yeah. question, I just want to make sure everybody remembers one anecdotal fact about Tom Cruise and Maverick in both movies. Tom Cruise is a gold star son from the Vietnam War in that storyline. <laughs> go back and watch both movies, you'll see it. it doesn't, they don't talk about it an awful lot, but he is a gold star son. Uh, next question over here. Dan, speaking of the airplanes coming apart, tell us about your flight over La Jolla. <laughs> oh, I was flying with uh, Rattler. Uh, in addition to the, in addition to Top Gun training, getting it started and everything, uh, 
we flew uh, routinely on an almost daily basis. One of our flights was with the training rag, training the, the normal pilot pipeline. And I was out, it was about, about three something in the afternoon and Rattler's chasing me and I got a student in the back, about his eighth flight in the Phantom. And, uh, and Rattler's got a, a guy with him. And we're out, we're actually down the fight club. And when you go out with Rattler, you better be prepared to defend yourself. Because when the training is over, you're gonna spend the rest of the fuel getting it on, what we call hassling. And uh, so I'm doing about 500 knots in the middle of an engagement with him. And boom, I hear the boom. And the warning lights come on. I got a phantom. I got a fire in the right engine. So I got, I flew it for about 70 miles, trying to get back into Miramar with it because the San Clemente runway was closed due to fog. And it was about 30 minutes before dark. And uh, I climbed up on the way back into Miramar, shut that engine down, and Mel comes sliding in on me, and he's sitting right under me. And he's talking to me. He said, he said, oh, he said, you're not going to like this. But he said, there's a lot of smoke and there's flames now. And he's, you know, we're brothers, this guy and I. So he's flying like a, I said, well, I'm going to go into Miramar. And he said, okay, you're looking good and you're looking good. And all of a sudden I look out and I'm looking at the belly and he's pulling away from me. At that time, the rear in the rear of the Phantom, it had a liquid oxygen chamber full of liquid oxygen. Well, the fire got back to liquid oxygen and it blew the tail off the airplane. So I went end over end and I made it about two and then I told Gil in the back, I said, you know, and I, I can, honest to God, I know I'm not connected by radio with Mel, but I know Mel was telling me, Jack, you got and I, I had to yell at Gil. I said, get out, get out. Boom. He blew us out of the airplane. And uh, it didn't end there. I ended up coming down. Parachute's supposed to open automatically, separate from the seat. And, and uh, well, at about 21,000 feet when we ejected, roughly. And uh, Mel Holmes later told me, at 2,400 feet, I still didn't have a parachute. So uh, I pulled a, pulled a D-ring, you know, John Wayne, World War II. <laughs> and I, I broke the steel cable in my gloved hands. Powerhouse. Boom. So I pulled it again, and I separated from the seat, pushed it away, and I went up the risers, and I got the, I got the parachute. It was in a canister up here. So I got it and brought it down about this far with my fingers, and boom, it blossomed. And I swung twice, and I looked down, and you gotta remember, man, it's almost dark, and I see in the water these black lines. And I thought, oh, shit, I'm gonna get eaten by the shark. <laughs> I, I made it through all this, but now the sharks are there. And I lit in the water, my my little raft, about this wide, I don't know, about that wide, just big enough for a guy like me. And I put my feet up on the end, and I'm in a flight suit. It's cold, ooh, it's cold. 13th of February, I put my feet up on the end, and I'm thinking, I made it, but it's really cold. And pretty soon, boom, boom, two snouts come up on the foot of the raft, and they're they're, uh, they're, uh, what? Dolphins. <laughs> they're two dolphins. And you know those two boogers stayed with me until the helicopter came. They stayed there and they, you haven't, they talked back and forth. They were so excited. <laughs> so was I. <laughs> All right, we have time for one last question right here. Yeah, Dan, the, um, you started Top Gun in 1969. You talked about going from a 2 to 1 to a 24 to 1 kill ratio because yeah. Top Gun was all about air-to-air -air combat. Yeah. If, if my research is correct, no 
American aviator has shot down an enemy aircraft since 1999 in Kosovo. Yeah. Are, are, have, are we completely losing the art of air-to-air -air combat? Oh, no, we will never lose it. That's the reason we started it at Top Gun, is, is we got to be historians. we got to remember the lessons from the Second World War in Korea. And you know what? There wasn't a whole lot tactically new. We had to adapt to the new air, or to the Phantom. But the, the tactics were the same ones in the first fighter squadron I was in as a student. There were five aces from the Second World War. I happened to get to fly wing on Gino Valencia. For those of you who have been around the military, Gene Valencia is the third living ace in, in Navy history. And I got to see him every day and talk with him. I learned a lot. And I, we, everything we did at Top Gun came down from experience in American naval aviators before us, almost everything. So, no. Um, a lot of people are interested in the Israelis. The Israelis are as good as their press is. They are plenty good. And I had been flying with the Israelis, and the reason we were able to put the reason we were able to put Top Gun together in the time frame was Itan Ben Legal. Excuse the name, it's hard to pronounce for me. He had been with me and had been, in fact, down at our house in Bonita. They've been house guests down there when they were in this country. And I learned from that guy alone when you have, when you have a short fuse or timeline to get something done. Select your people by specialties. And that's what I did. How's the eight guys I picked? Jimmy Rulison, Cobra Rulison, probably the smartest guy I've ever known. God, he was brilliant. He solved all the problems with the radar, solved all the problems with the firing envelopes and the missile systems alone by himself with the help of Raytheon. No consultants had anything to do with Top Gun. I had Navy chiefs that worked for me. I brought them in to help help us troubleshoot the airplanes when we were done flying them. But it was all, no contractors, no subcontractors. It was all done by young guys and a few old white-haired Navy chiefs who kept us all going strong. I would be remiss if we didn't conclude this with, uh, without paying tribute to one anniversary that's coming up in two weeks. Uh, as you read the book, you'll, you'll learn that in late January of 1973, two of your very good friends, Harley Hall and Phil Kinsler, were shot down over Vietnam. Uh, Phil was captured and, and came home in Operation Homecoming, but Harley didn't. And uh, it's important to mark that milestone because it's 50 yeah. years that 50 years ago later this month that that happened and uh, interestingly enough in May of this year the Nixon Library will host the 50th anniversary of Operation Homecoming in which America's POWs came home from North Vietnam so uh, I, I just want to make sure that we touch that and, and we acknowledge both of them yeah. for that anniversary that well, is coming up yeah. Boy, borderline politics. Um, we will never leave anybody behind, right? Yeah. Harley got shot down. I got called on Friday night at home down here in Bonita, California. I got called on Friday night to pack your bag. You're going out and replace Harley. And I said, what? And he said he got shot down 20 minutes before the armistice. President Nixon's armistice when it became effective. The last mission of the war, one of the greatest guys, this guy had been leader of the Blue Angels. He gets bagged and, and I ended up going out. He had the most wonderful wife and two, two kids, one of them he never saw. And this government never would finalize that situation. It 
that's the reality of what you do for a living once in a while if you if war happens but I think of what you're doing Tony with your gold star families and your gold star kids I've met Harley's kids they're grown now they're families of their own but nobody ever paid any attention to them other than their great mother you know so there's another thing we can do just like you're doing thank you ladies and gentlemen please give it up for Dan Pedersen Uh, Dan, Dan will be signing books. I mean, uh, taking pictures with you guys up here in the front lobby, um, if you guys want. And then I'll drive safe. Have a great night.